Well, good morning, Mercy Road. Can we just take a moment to acknowledge God's faithfulness all night up until like 8.45 this morning? The weather was not what we've been praying for. And we have a ton of people outside, a ton of tables, a ton of things that we want to make available to you. And it was going to be an incredible experience outside, much better than if we had to go inside. And then at 8.45, the rain stopped. So can we just give it up for God's faithfulness this morning? I mean, woo! Praise the Lord for his faithfulness, and the rain did stop. Also, could you guys welcome us, or those of us who are online, worship with us this morning as well? Thank you so much for joining us. Hit that like button and share, so we can get this message to more people. Well, as Pastor Josh just said in the, the video, this is week four, and the final week of our sermon series on the afterlife, where in week one, we talked about the fun topic, everyone dies. What is the implication of that? What is the promised afterlife? What does the Bible teach about those who believe in Jesus Christ and those who choose not to believe in Jesus Christ? What happens when we die? Week two, we went into an even deeper, far more uncomfortable conversation, and we looked at what the Bible has to say about hell. We did a deep dive. What is hell? Is it real? What does Jesus say about it? And if it is real, which we concluded it is, what are the implications of that? And then last week, Pastor Josh talked about a little bit lighter, more enjoyable conversation. Heaven. Is heaven real? What does the Bible say about heaven? And then again, as followers of Jesus, what is the implications of the fact that heaven is real? And then this morning, we're going to wrap up this whole series. Since we know those three things are real, those three things are reality, what now? How do we live now that we know that? And I don't know how you walked into this room this morning, but every single one of us is probably coming in with a question about, okay, God, what now? But this is a broad question. For thousands of years, scholars have tried to figure out what is the right way to live? What is right? What is wrong? What is the thing that God is asking us to do? And as a result of it, in America, we have hundreds and hundreds of denominations who are just slightly having a different answer to that specific question. But this morning, we want to make sure we take time to figure out what is next. What now? Since heaven is real, since hell is real, and both are an option, what are the implications and how do we live today? And as we start our conversation on this this morning, I want to take you all the way back to my sophomore year of high school, where I was a pastor's kid, a group of a pastor's kid. My dad was my pastor growing up. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit, for whatever reason, was asking me to read the book of Acts. And so I start in Acts chapter 1, and I read about all these incredible things that Jesus does at the very beginning. And then his disciples are left with asking the question, what now? Jesus leaves. He goes up into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And then they're just sitting there going, what do we do now? And then I get to Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost. It actually talks about how uh, speaking in tongues comes, and God gives them the ability to speak in other people's languages to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to anyone and everyone who's ready to hear it. And then I get to Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47, our primary verses this morning that we're going to look at. And I'm reading it, and I get to this place, and I, I remember I just, I'm reading it, and I go to my dad, and I'm going, Dad, I have a problem. I'm struggling. He goes, okay, what's up? And when I just read Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47, and I looked to my left and to my right in the church I grew up in, and I go, I don't see this anywhere. This fresh movement of the Holy Spirit where people are just coming and being devoted to the cause of Christ. They are giving their lives to Jesus left and right. It says daily they're giving their life to Jesus. I'm like, I just don't see this. And for the first time in my life, in my spiritual journey, I read something in scripture that sounded amazing, and then I looked into my life, and I didn't see it. Have you ever been there? Similarly, you know that there are basically two things that every American has to do, pay taxes and die. I mean, what's the implications of that? And I, as a sophomore in high school, realized something was amiss. I felt convicted, but I had no idea what the answer was. And I looked at all the people I loved and I respected. And I go, man, something just isn't right with this. But I love Jesus. I love the church. What's wrong? 
Let's read the verses that the Holy Spirit used to convict me that he actually used to call me into ministry. In Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47 says this, those who accepted his message, the message actually Peter was preaching, where the speaking of the tongues comes and they hear the word of God in their own language. It says they, were, they accepted this message and were baptized and 3,000 were added to their number that day. They, all of the people, so in Acts chapter one and two, the beginning we see there's about roughly 120 people who are devoted to the cause of Christ before this particular day. So roughly now in, in verse 42, there are 3,120 people. They all together were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone, not a few, not just a few special people, everyone, those who just discovered Jesus that day and those who've walked with Jesus for three and a half years, every single one of them, you this morning can experience this. We're filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and this is a crazy thought, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all of the people. And the Lord continued to add, this was the verse that really stuck out to me when I was 16 years old. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now see here at Mercy Road, we have the privilege of being in a church, quite frankly, that God has been doing some incredible things. Since Easter, we've had almost 100 people give their life to Jesus for the very first time. We give it up for that. Come on. So I read this, and I'm like, okay, there's been less than 100 days since Easter, so that seems accurate. That's awesome. But at the age of 16, I finally looked at my dad, and I went, I don't remember the last time I ever heard somebody give their life to Jesus. And I was convicted. I'm like, what is happening here? How could we get to this verse and wonder what's going on? How is it, Dad, that we love Jesus and we're committed to this, but we don't see people coming to Christ? And for, I don't know where you come into this room, but I'm sure you have something in your heart and mind that sounds like this. For the very first time, there was a massive disconnect between the promise of the power of God in Acts chapter 2 and the power of God living in me and through me and around me. I'm like, okay, I see all these amazing things in Acts chapter 2. But wow, I don't see it in my workplace. Wow, I don't see it in high school. Because I was a high school student at the time. Wow, I just don't see it in my church. And I longed to see this happen. And then, as I was reading this passage this week, it reminded me why every pastor who preaches here at Mercy Road says two phrases. It's because of this message, this passage right here in Acts chapter 2. Mercy Road is not a museum for saints. The church I grew up in was a master at being a museum for the saints. Mercy Road's calling, our reason for gathering to worship Jesus and collectively together is because we believe we are a church that is a hospital for sinners. Amen. Amen. But that's not what I saw. Now, here's the thing, though, church. It's a clever slogan but it only is realized when we as the people are devoted to that mission. We have it on our wall, on the other side here. It's a beautiful decor. It's awesome. But it only matters when we as the church step up and do it. So I love that the pastors say this every single week, that we are not a museum for saints. We are a hospital for sinners. But we don't just stop there. Because we also believe, because of what we see here, that random 3,000 people, we don't know their story. Some were probably super far from God. Some who were questioning and considering it up to that day. We believe no one, despite what crazy resume of life experiences they've collected, no one is too far from God to be apprenticed into a passionate relationship with Jesus. Again, it's a clever slogan. I love it. I love it. But it's only real and true when we buy into it. And that's something as we as 
brand new believers who just gave their life to Jesus and like the 11 high school students who were baptized last Sunday at third service. It only is real when we dive into it. And back to sophomore Jeremy in high school who looked at the church that he loved and went, oh my goodness, we have these clever slogans, but I don't see it. Where is the movement of the Holy Spirit? And as a church, we've been privileged to see it. For those of us who have just given our life to Jesus since Easter and have been baptized, the question you're now faced with is, what now? For those of us who've been Christians for a long time like myself, and we're called to apprentice people into a deep, passionate relationship with Jesus. Did you hear that? We're not just here to celebrate that someone gives their life to Jesus, and we're not just here to celebrate baptism. For those of us who have been baptized and are giving their life to Jesus, we are called to apprentice others into a relationship with Jesus, and it takes us apprentice, are you catching it? Apprenticing people into a relationship with Jesus. That was the disconnect I saw. And at this moment in Acts, we're going to dig deeper into this in a minute, but at that moment in Acts, every disciple, every person who just gave their life to Jesus was asked the question, was asking the question, what now? If you are a believer in Jesus, the question of what now is how to ensure everybody else experiences what we experience and how to become an apprentice or be a, a discipler of someone else. So the question is, for you this morning, Jesus died, was resurrected, gave us new life. Hell is real. Heaven is real. What now? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that your spirit would just come alive, fall fresh, just like it did in Acts chapter 2, we pray. Lord, I just pray that this morning that your spirit would move and that you would convict our hearts just like you did a 16-year-old Jeremy who had no idea what he was convicted by, but just knew something was amiss. I pray that your spirit would come and fall fresh upon us again this morning. May we not just celebrate the past, but we also not be satisfied with the past. May we all fully be devoted into the future of what you're calling Mercy Road to do. So Lord, whether we don't even understand who this Jesus guy is yet, I pray that your spirit would fall on that person and you would show yourself to be real and they would fall into this new, profound relationship with you. And for those of us who've already done that, we've been living a life with you, whether for a day or for years, I pray that you would, we would put it on our hearts to join into the fresh movement of your Holy Spirit that I believe you want to do today. Not sometime in the future, but today. So open up our hearts and our ears. Maybe we be ready to hear your words. Fill me, God, with your spirit and your words this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So in 2008, Sarah and I are getting engaged, and she is going off for a spring break trip to Florida. And you know, when you're young and you're in love, you're used to spending like every second together, right? Like, you know, just young love. You're together every, every evening, every morning. You're texting all the time. Messaging, phone calls, whatever. Well, this particular time, Sarah goes off to Florida without me, leaving me at home. And boyfriend is now lonely. And what do you typically do? You just text and call and all that stuff. Well, for those of you who are too young to know, in 2008, texting was a brand new phenomenon. Okay? The iPhone had just come out. And texting wasn't a thing, to the point that a texting plan, nobody had unlimited texting yet. Texting plans went into the, a, a grouping of 250 text messages. And that 250 text messages included those being sent by you and those received by you. It doesn't take very long for that 250 a month to basically be gone. But it was still rare that families had a texting plan, even if it was just 250. My family did not. But while on a spring break trip on Florida, Sarah decides that she wants to send a picture of the beach and send it to me to make me jealous. So she sends the picture. I receive it via a text message. It was the first one I'd ever received. I'm like, this is the coolest thing. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize I could talk to Sarah whenever the heck I wanted. And whenever she was free, she could just text me. I didn't know this was a thing. This is so cool. So what do I do? I start texting her like any young guy who misses their girlfriend constantly. 
I'm like, this is amazing. After a week, she comes back. I miss her. But then we realize that there's this new way of communicating. And that when I go back off to college, I can text her. And we can send videos to each other. We can text pictures to each other. I didn't realize that videos and pictures were actually internet data, not a text message. And for those of you who used to have paid for a cell phone plan back in 2008, you know that those are quite expensive. I didn't know you had to pay for them, okay? To add to it, for those of you who didn't know this, back then, you didn't have unlimited minutes. You could call whenever you wanted to. Actually, it was smart to call before 9 a.m. or after 9 p.m. because it was free. And my family had collected hundreds, if not thousands, of what they used to call rollover minutes. And one week, Sarah and I used all of the rollover minutes and more, and I started texting. So May comes, and the cell phone bill comes. And my mom comes inside from getting the mail after coming home from work, and she goes, hey, Jeremy, could you come downstairs to the kitchen? I'm like, sure, Mom. I'm thinking, okay, I got to clean the dishes. I got to prep for dinner that night. Maybe I'm cooking. I don't know. It's like, sweet. Sounds great. So she comes downstairs, and she goes, um, <clears throat> how was Sarah's trip? I'm like, it was really good, Mom. We've already talked about this. What's up? She goes, well, I see on the phone bill that you started texting, and you guys talked a lot. And I was like, yeah, why is this a big deal? She goes, well, we don't have texting. And you have to pay for every single one. And I had racked up over a $200 bill for texting <laughs> alone. Add in all the phone calls on top of that. And I'm sitting there going, my $5.50 at Wendy's an hour doesn't go very far. And I'm starting to calculate how much that texting costs me. But let's be honest, I'm 20 years old. I'm enjoying young love. It's great. I'm not worried about it. You know what I say? I like, Mom, it's not a big deal. Actually, in fact, I have a gif that I want you guys to see that just kind of encompassed my reaction, my initial reaction to my mom as she's worried about this texting bill. This is actually how I felt. Got, uh... I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. That's how I felt. <laughs> texting mom, it's great. I can text her whatever I want. And I'm like, phone number, it's fine. We'll, just, we'll go back to nine after nine. She goes, no, 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 Jeremy. That was all of April. We're now in the second week of May, and you've done it again. I'm happy that you lovebirds are feeling great about things, but you will pay for this entire bill. I'm like, oh, uh oh, really? Can we negotiate here? I don't have that much money. And then she goes, Well, I'm glad that you don't care. Who knows that you're in love, but you're going to pay this bill. My mother, in all of her gracious, sweet self, had a come to Jesus meeting with me. Because I would have continued to do it, which I did. My brother still owe me this day because that day she signed us up for an unlimited texting plan. I was just a good brother. What can I say? But I needed to have a come to Jesus moment because my actions, unknown to me, were creating ripple effects of problems. Similar for the church, we don't always know what we're doing. And young in our relationship with Jesus, we can sound a lot like Will Ferrell in the movie Elf. But that's not where it ends, that's where it begins. And although I was young in my love and my expression with my wife, or then girlfriend, I was loving it, I needed to have the come to Jesus moment. And I think it's actually time for Mercy Road to have the same. And it seems peculiar for me to suggest this as a pastor for you because we just had 11 baptisms and the Holy Spirit's been moving. But this is why I think we need to have a come to Jesus moment is because we've had such an incredible movement of the Holy Spirit through our church that it's easy to just expect that that's going to happen and not invest into the work of the Holy Spirit. So the come to Jesus moment I think the church needs to have this morning is this. It's one that requires a transformation of our hearts and mind as church people and as new followers of Jesus Christ to take place now. We need to make a commitment to see the fruit of the Spirit that we've been seeing plant, root, and actually grow into a sustainable, passionate relationship with Jesus. So for the next 15 to 20 minutes, this is my hope, is to show you, as any good pastor does, 
Three ways. To respond to a fresh new movement of the Holy Spirit that we've been seeing. First and foremost, here's the first one. We must be a passionately devoted church for the gospel. Acts chapter 2, 42 says this. They, all 3,120, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were haphazard about it. They occasionally showed up. The Sunday morning vicariously lived through a Sunday morning experience. No, they devoted themselves. Now, I had to go into a deep dive because I'm like, what does it mean to be devoted? What did that mean back then? This is what the Greek word actually means for devoted to take it in its full form. To live in a constant. So as I say this, I want you to think about it for just a minute. Is this your level of devotion to the cause of Christ? Not that Mercy Road Church grows. No, no, no. That the kingdom of God grows and people are finding a relationship with Jesus. Living in a constant state of relentless pursuit. Does that resonate or is that convicting? To live in a constant state of relentless pursuit, ongoing, never-ending devotion for the cause of Christ. We need to be fully devoted people, making sure that everything is all about the cause of of Christ. Now, that one's not a surprise, I think. We, we kind of get that. If we've been in church at all for a few days, okay, I got to be devoted to this thing. I gave my life to Christ. I've surrendered my all, as we like to say. Like, I gave everything. That one's easy. But it just gets harder from here. Because the second thing we must do is we actually, and this one is going to hit, we must be irrationally generous. And this is not a sermon about money, but generosity requires us to talk about it. So let's read what verse 44 through 46 says this about the early church's new found devotion and now irrational, irrational generosity. All believers, not a few of them, not those who've been in church for a while, not just the 20% who do 80% of the work, all the believers were together and had, this is a challenging thought, everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet the needs. Every day. Now I want to get on this one part. Everything in common. Now, is there a group of people, or maybe there's a person in your life who is like, I have a lot not in common with that person. For me, I have a group of people. It's called Chicago Cubs fans. <laughs> I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. If you're a Colts fan, you probably have very little in common with all Tom Brady fans. Because... No, I am not going to like that person because there's no chance. There is a six-month period of the year where I cannot like Cubs fans. Are you a Cubs fan? Any Cubs fans in the room? Oh, good. Okay, great. You guys are doing great. The Cardinals stink this year, so it doesn't really matter. I have nothing to talk about. We're in last place in the entire major leagues. But you know that there are people in your life that you are not in common with. And I bring this up because it is not their responsibility to become common with us. It is our responsibility to make sure that our heart is aligned to passionately pursue them for the love of Jesus. The church has a groups of people that we are historically known to not be in common with. And this common theme is not about intellect. They're not talking about ideologies. They're not talking about do we agree with X, Y, and Z. It is in common with what? a devotion and a passion for Jesus. And yet, myself included, going back as a sophomore in high school, I see all the ways I was not in common with people. If we're gonna be a people who ask the question, what now? And we agree and believe in all the things we've talked about the last three weeks about the afterlife, this is a massive question we must answer. We must be irrationally generous with our heart. So you thought I was going to talk about money. But I think the thing that we need to be most irrationally generous with is our heart. The way in which I picture it is like, imagine having your heart in your hand. And you have the ability to give it, which is vulnerable and scary, or you have the ability to squeeze it and hold on to it. And you know there are people in your life where your reaction and your, your and just 
first go-to is to squeeze it and hide it and pull it away. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna give you that. Yet for whatever reason, somehow by the grace of Jesus, 3,120 people who barely knew each other, if at all, had everything in common within weeks. Why? Because their hearts were irrationally generous to the person they didn't even know. And they were irrationally generous to the person they didn't even like. So we've seen all this incredible movement here at Mercy Road. It can stop with a halt if we don't get this right. But being devoted to the cause of Christ, being irrationally generous all alone, won't do it. We have to dive into this third point. We will be unapologetically, we will unapologetically share the love of Jesus. This is where the uncommon part becomes common and we become together. Acts 46 and 47, or Acts 2, 46 and 47 said this. Every day, they continued, every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day is a huge, is a huge clarifier here. Why? In Acts chapter two, in the very beginning, the coming of the Holy Spirit comes. Most of these 3,000 people who gave their life to Jesus were Jews who did not live in Jerusalem. This was a foreign land. They had to make an intentional decision to unapologetically do whatever it took to be in community with these new people who are following and apprenticing them in their relationship with Jesus. If I want to talk to just for a minute to those of us in the room who've given our lives to Jesus for a while, and we've been in church for a while. If you've been through Rooted, if you've been in a huddle at all before, maybe you haven't, I just want to talk to you for just a second, and I'll get to the rest of us in the room. Is that you? Because I love the movement of the Holy Spirit happening in our church. But again, it could stop on a dime if we are not willing to unapologetically share the love of Jesus. And one of the best ways we do that is through our time and our commitment. Because you don't get irrationally generous without being unapologetically in love with Jesus. And you can't be devoted to ensuring that everyone who comes into our midst falls in love with this Jesus guy who came and died for you and me without unapologetically sharing the love of Jesus. But can we be honest? That's like the scariest thing to be asked to do. When was the last time you unapologetically shared the love of Jesus? In contrast to my second point about being irrationally generous to ensure that we have everything in common in the name of Jesus, this one will create a division within our society, but it's going to call people into a relationship with Jesus. So what type of church is Mercy Road? What type of church are we? Are we a church that truly believes that no one is too far from God to be apprenticed into a new passionate relationship with Jesus? I believe we are, but will we as collectively and as you as an individual is that something that you truly believe in? Because that's the answer to what now? Will we be a church that is a hospital for sinners? Or will we become one who celebrates the movements of the past? Because the what now behind the fact that all of us someday will die and heaven and hell are real is the answer to this question. Let me finish with this. In Jonah chapter 1, all the way to the Old Testament. If you've been in church at all, you've probably heard this story. Jonah is the guy who was called by God to go to the land of Nineveh, but he didn't want to do it. Some of us, including myself in this room, I kind of hesitate with this message because I'm not sure I want to live this. And Jonah was asked to go. And what happens, he says no. And eventually we know the part of the story where he is swallowed up by a fish. Before he's swallowed up by a fish, He finds himself running away from the the opposite direction of Nineveh on a ship. And then a huge storm comes. And in Jonah chapter 1, verse 6, we find that the captain of the ship goes to Jonah as the ship is about to be overtaken by waves. And he says, Jonah, how can you be asleep? 
get up and call on your God. The church that I grew up in, that's what I saw. I saw a lot of people who love the stories of the past but had fallen asleep. And my call was like, church, wake up. Why are you asleep? How could you be asleep? And he, and he finishes it by saying this, Jonah, maybe your God will take notice of us and we will not perish. I want to end with this challenge. Imagine you're at a stoplight and the stoplight's out. The most annoying thing when you're driving, right? You're in a hurry and it's just blinking or maybe there's no power at all. And so the Carmel would send a police officer there to direct traffic right? But imagine it up to that stoplight that's out and traffic is stopped. And the only way there's any sense of order is when the officer does what he's been empowered to do. So you get up to that stoplight and the officer's just sitting there playing on their phone. And they're not doing what they've been empowered to do. They've fallen asleep on their job and they're doing nothing. How do you feel when you get to that stop sign or stoplight? Annoyed, angry, come on. There are so many people in our community, in Greater Carmel, and Indianapolis area, who is coming up to a stop sign and seeing Christians just like me and you, who have been empowered to do the work of Christ, who have been called to be devoted, irrationally generous, and unapologetic with our message for Jesus, yet we've fallen asleep on the job. And people are coming trying to find Jesus. And they only find an average 20% doing 80% of the work. Yet Miss Mercy Road would say, we believe nobody's too far to be apprenticed. Here's, here's my call. If you could just stand up with me. We're going to end a little bit different this morning. If you could stand up with me, I want you to hear these words. We are not called to be spiritual consumers. We are called to be spiritual contributors. We're going to go out to our outpost fair in just a minute and give you 15 minutes. For those of you who have kids, you got 15 minutes outside, and then you can come back inside and get your kids. But Jesus did not die for us to fall asleep. The church, Mercy Road, exists so that the broken and the dead in our community could be resurrected with the love and grace of Jesus. Church, let's wake up. Let's not fall asleep. Let's not get caught praising the past, but anticipating the work of the future and being committed and devoted to it. So here's my question for you. If you could just join me in the posture of humility and prayer like this. As we go into this song, I ask you to be like this because I want us to be in a humble place to hear God speak to us. Here's the question. Here's the challenge. Are you more concerned with building your own kingdom, your own resume, your own career, your own family? Are you more concerned with all the things you, or are you more concerned with helping advance the kingdom of God and ensuring that the lost are apprenticed? Which one are you more concerned with? The answer to what now lies with the answer to that question.